Praise God. So, remember now Charles the Great has been installed as the resurrected Roman Empire. Why? Because the Empress system had died during that time. You know, because they failed to get um, kingdoms started becoming stronger. You understand? Than many emperors. And that means some emperors could not control certain what? Kingdoms. Are you following? And because of that, the Roman Empire started to die because many emperors were not strong enough to hold certain kingdoms, right? That's why I talked about Clovis, one of the Franks. The Franks was a big group. They were not just what you see as the French. They were a mixture of the Germans and what. This was a huge group. The French, as we know them, get into even the Russian. This is a huge, huge uh, group of people. So that's when the Clovis fellow comes through. I hope you now understand that part. And then uh, Lusevich, Charles Martel, Pippin, Pippin, Chalamé, or Charles the Great. Then Charles the Great, like I said, he is ordained in 800 A.D. as the, the, yes, the resurrected emperor of Rome. That means now, because he's the strongest king in Europe, consequently, we, and he has a connection to the Church of Rome. So Rome sees an opportunity to seize that and then take that to power because he has allegiance to the Roman Catholic Church, and consequently, Rome gets on top again. Praise God. Like I said, gave birth to lords because everyone said, I think you can also start also go taking over lands and fighting for spaces and what you have, you lord over it and then you use it the way you want. So like I said, that's when we have landlords, landladies, right? The serfs used to live there and work on the knights. Who are the knights? Knights were the people who were protectors of the lords, right? And because the lords were rich, they used to live in what? Castles. Praise God. And so that's where the idea comes in the feudalism. But also, in, because of the feudalistic idea, something interesting happens. Because if Constantine said there is no paying of taxes for the churches, believers are not supposed to pay anything, and you know, bishops are respected and all, what of the churches that are built in the lands where the lords own? Hmm? Because now everyone has started to fight for property and own it. Hmm? What of those lands where they are churches, and these churches are on the lands that are owned by these lords who have taken over them by fighting for them because they've hired knights, right? You just hire a group of guys like 10, 20 fellows, you tell them, let's go evade this area. Kill everyone that is there and take over 500 acres of land. And now I've become a landlord. But on that acreage of land, there are what? There are churches. So who do those churches belong to? Yes. The landlord will say, no, if you're on my land also, regardless of whether Constantine passed it, you now have to pay to be on that land even as a church. You see what I'm saying? And then also another politics is bust there. Charles the Great doesn't mind it. He says, you go ahead. It's not something that disturbed Charles because Charles was bigger than someone owning land. Remember, he was the emperor of Rome. Rome had died. The church in Rome took advantage of the fact that the emperor position had died and took advantage of the strongest kings and, and now the empire is built. Charles the Great has a lot to think about than fighting for someone who is fighting over its 300 acres of land. Europe was his. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Now, these landlords say you have your church on my land, that church you have to pay to live on that church. But also, because we own the lands on where your churches are, politics started to get in concept of simony came through. Who knows what simony is? Simony comes through the definition of the book of Acts which speaks of Simon, the sorcerer, who for a pay wanted power for the Holy Spirit. Now, it pushes these religious leaders to start buying um, influences from the landlords. List, they, lose, they lose their positions in the churches and their authority in the churches because then the landlords became the owners 
direct owners of the churches. Right? So you need to treat the landlord well, lest you lose your ministry. Simony, right? And so they start extending favors to landlords such that they'll be favored. But also, another thing, nepotism came through. The favoring of family members, right? To take up certain positions. So some of these landlords, he would grow up with his son, and the son is a good preacher. I tell him, hey, why don't you go take over the church in one of our properties? You understand? Because the churches then were looked at as sources of income. They were business. Remember, indulgences are still taking place. Manipulations and purgatory are still there. You understand what I'm saying? And so it happens that way. What do you think that leads to? A time is going to come where people are going to get tired. You understand? In every situation, or is not that that when a system oppresses people, they'll either push for reforms or opt for a revolution. If there is no middle ground, we either talk about it and you change the system, or we fight ourselves through it. And that's exactly what happened. More than 300 monasteries refused to pay landlords, and they said, "Now kill us." Praise God. Now kill us. We are ready to die, but we're not going to do that. And then again, war ensues between the Christians who have refused to pay landlords and the landlords who must tell these guys to leave. And these guys say, no, we've refused. And then war again also erupted through there. And many, many things uh, happened. But during that time, there was a fellow, a pope, very interestingly, who was called Gregory the Seventh. I want to share a story about this guy because I find it interesting. Gregory the seventh during that time he comes through and he says you know what I'm going to ban simony and nepotism It's wrong because they you know appeals were made even to the Pope and and the emperors And then there was a lot of bickering in and out and then they said you know what? Let's stop this thing years later. So Gregory passes and says you know what from today no more uh, Simony no more nepotism he doesn't take out the responsibilities the landlords still have towards the churches. For him, his problem was you paying for your position or putting your relatives, but the system continued. Right? And then he accuses a certain fellow called Henry the Fourth, who was a king then. He tells him, Henry, you are responsible. This fellow was the king of Germany. You're responsible for simony. You're paying and using other people to pay for positions such that you influence through the church. The king of Germany. And then he told him, you have to account. Henry said, but I'm also the king of the Germans. Who are you the Pope to talk to me that way? What authority do you have to talk to me that way? Now, when he did that, Gregory the Seventh interdicted Henry the Fourth. What did he do? He said, from today, no church in Germany should give Holy Communion. We've cut German off from doing Holy Communion. Now let me explain. In the early Roman Catholic Church, Holy Communion was the holiest benevolence. That separating men from Holy Communion meant you were submitting them to a curse. That means Germany was automatically cast. Because you see, the, look at how the elements were handled. The Pope or the spiritual leader was the mediator. They already say Jesus was the mediator between Christ and the church and the Pope was the mediator between Jesus and the church so the Pope says no I don't have a problem nobody gets to the father except through him but nobody gets to him <laughs> except what this is standard Roman Catholic doctrine so it is me the Pope who receives the power the authority the instruction by Roman standard, Roman Catholic standard, you're not even allowed to touch the bread. You're unholy. It's the priest supposed to put it in your mouth during that time. You understand? Because there was a holiness that came to that. In fact, if you look at the earlier photos of the Roman Catholic Church, they even used to put um, cages so that people don't come near the priest when he's giving Holy Communion. Because once you ate it, you, they literally made sure that these stopped being elements and figures. There was the real Christ and the real blood. So imagine being denied to eat of Christ and drink of him for one year. What are you going to attract? So telling Henry the force that no more communion in Germany, 
that was like everybody, a public outro comes through and tells Henry, you're dead. We are going to die. Our children in trouble. We shall oust you. How can you do that? What happens? Pressure is put on Henry. Henry does what? That was about 1029. Uh, between 1029 to, yeah, between that time. And then he goes to the Pope. And then he goes to ask for forgiveness. And the Pope put that guy in the cold winter for three days and humiliated him as a child, like a child. And then after the third day, he forgave who? Henry. The Pope had a new weapon from that day. Now Europe started to fear because if the Pope curses you, if the Pope is annoyed, now they don't need guns. No. They don't need arrows. The Pope just needs to say, I'm not going to step in your nation, and you're dead. Why? Because the Pope not stepping in your nation means Jesus. It's going to take so long to visit your side <laughs> of the corner. Praise God. Praise God. And so that now gives power to the papacy. And all through from the 10 hundreds, 11 hundreds, 12 hundreds, 13 hundreds, power and authority in the entire world now relied on the Roman Catholic Church. And of course they built huge cathedrals to make statements. Because for them the buildings are key. Also they built schools. Salome was the first guy, Charles the Great, was the first guy to bring the idea of schools. How does that happen? He used to see young boys playing around, leisure, right? In fact the literal word leisure means school, which is school. So he says, we should laser these children in teaching them reading, writing, and arithmetic. The first oldest ideas we know about education begin from about that time. Now they start educating. Everyone should read, everyone should write, everyone should do arithmetic, but you don't interpret the word. That one is for the Pope and the few designated people who read it a certain way. Praise God. So the papacy becomes bigger, gets into the monarchy. One Boniface, the eighth, uh, the eighth, I believe in the 1300, said, I am Caesar. He said, I am Caesar and I am emperor. Because remember, from the time of Salome, Charles the Great, it was the popes who used to make emperors. So he has the power to say, no longer emperor. And the whole Europe turns against you. Because Catholicism favors him and religion is stronger than political influence. That's why governments prefer sometimes to control religion. Because religion can become stronger than politics. Men can die for Jesus easily than they can die for a political idea. And you know what I'm trying to talk about. And many have died. Praise God. And the sacraments are there. Blood symbols of communion are there. And before you know that it began it becomes a big, big, big thing. Everything you know corrupt in the world started to happen in the Roman Catholic Church. Because absolute power corrupts. There's too much power. Too much power. That is why when you say, oh, we want one person to be in charge of all the born again in Uganda. How? Do you know how much power that is? That is too much power. It's too much power. If, if you can't even, if just running your household, for those of you who are married, you understand, just, you have responsibilities in your house. What about the world? You understand what I'm saying? And, and sadly, I see Pentecostals move that way. Sadly, I see Pentecostals move that way. But it's the love of power. Local church must have authority above it, but that authority also must be accountable to some authority. We believe in spiritual authorities and accountability to spiritual authority, but we don't believe in a place where one man represents all. Even your authority did not die for you, nor shed his blood. So his responsibilities are defined clearly. They shouldn't go beyond a certain place. He did not shed his blood for you. I didn't. Church members from my church, I did not die for your sins. You understand? Because that place has also been abused. Recently, I find a girl who said, you know what, if my spiritual father is going to hell, I'm going to hell too. I told her, but what? 
are we still talking about the gospel anymore? No, we're talking about something else. Authorities are in our lives obey Hebrews 13, 17 says that they have rule over you, watch over you, they should do it with joy, so you profit, yes, obey them, continually recognize the authority over you, but only as in Christ. Follow me even as I follow, imitate me even as I imitate. If you man of God goes outside Christ, I'm sorry, my soul is more important. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, because of that, what happens? There's a need. Again, a lot of pressure is coming through. Many people, because they're saying, is this going to continue this way? Are we going to continue venerating Mary? She's now the way to heaven. And how is Mary the figure built? Why? Because when the church starts to follow Roman system and culture, Roman system is patriarchal. Yeah? It doesn't have appointments of women. And so to give comfort to the women who had fellowships in the days when the church was underground and in the catacombs, women fellowships, women were running fellowships in their homes, they needed to give strength to the female figure. And so they create the figure of Mary to comfort the women who had fellowships then because there was no provision for women ministers in a church that had arrayed its order and system and structure in the way of Rome. Romans don't believe in the leadership of women. Somebody shout hallelujah. Women were like nothing. So I think you see why Mary was very important. Says so that now there's that emotional part of, oh, do you know what it's like? For, because, and again also I realized through Catholic, Lauren Catholic doctrine, Mary was put as a place as the soft mother figure that understood you when Christ didn't. <laughs> you read history. You, you know that. So they used to tell us, if Jesus is annoyed, go to the mother. Why? Because one time when he wanted to turn water into wine and then they refused, she told him, make it. And anyway, he was. Many. So you see the figure of the mother. Now they call her the queen of heaven. Listen, queen of heaven, lady of light, going to the son to tell him, my son, forgive Apostle Grace. Forgive Pastor Grace. Forgive Pastor Sam. Have mercy on him. And then they forgive you. So Mary became more merciful than that is why if you're in the Roman Catholic, you always realize the lights were always on two people. The bigger light was on Mary, the smaller one was on the Christ she was holding because Mary was venerated above the person of Jesus Christ. And so the challenge now comes as we are approaching the 1500s, right? All from that time, remember, from 590, liberal Christianity, I mean, the, the papacy, 351 to 590, uh, the imperial Christianity, into now the birth of the papacy, 590, all of those years up to the 1000s, 1100s, 1300s, 1400s, I want you to tell you that all of that time, the Roman Catholic Church was in charge. And that's why they call it the age of the Christendom, right? Because the church had the say in every political, it appointed and disappointed. Praise God. So I think you're following, eh? Yeah. Imperial Christianity, the Christendom, and now we enter into what we call the demand of reformation. The ramblings of reformation start. There's a problem. The teachings are many. The heresies are many. Men are broken by religion. Men are giving up. Men are drawing back to perdition. There is a group of guys called the poverty movement. Now, and one of the guys of the poverty movement is a guy you hear called St. Francis of Assisi. This guy saw how much wealth was amassed by the church unfairly. And then they decided to begin a movement called the poverty movement. And that movement was not poor, no. It was a movement where rich guys got together and gave away everything they had. And then they say, this is the way of Christ, not the amassing of money. Right? Now that group started to become more prominent than the popes that were demanding because in the 1300s, 1300s, it is written that popes even go to extents of sending armies to go and fight and loot gold for the church because it's also part of the indulgence to make you, right? They just tell you, go look for the enemies of the gospel. The wealth of the wicked is stored up for the just. <laughs> then you go in the name of the Pope, and then you go collect stuff for, for the people. So there was a group called the Poverty Movement. 
um, they were tired of this organized church of robbing people. And, and so sadly, up to now, people look at the church as a money-minting business, not a business of the kingdom and the souls. Because many tenets of Rome went into Anglican, went into Islam, and are in the born again movements and the Pentecostal movements, all of them carry that place. That's why some are against what we are calling the prosperity gospel. You know why? Because at the end of the day, we are not against prosperity. I preach prosperity for the soul. But it's not the standard of what makes me a man of God. I'm not a man of God because I have money on my account. I'm a man of God because I have a relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ as my Lord. And I don't and I'm not supposed to put anything above that. You understand? When you see Pentecostals, born again believers, flashing around with, flashing, and I mean flashing, I will not use, I will not say more. If you're mature, you understand what I mean. They are taking us back to Rome. Because that's how Rome, it's insecurity. It's insecurity. I'll tell you this. I was with my wife one time and I told her, I have never been to an embassy. And the reverend came for an interview and they didn't have a caller. You know why? Because when they stand before the interviewer, they look holy. Now, the man of God, Andrew Mark, I think they would deny him visa. <laughs> oh, Apostle Grace. Because we don't have royal garb. We don't have rings to kiss and, and, and carpets to walk on. And some people actually think that we are less ministers. We are not less. History has taught us something. History has taught us something. Never put your toys above your tools. Always put your tools ahead of your toys. It's important for men to see what you are doing with the gospel than what you're driving with the gospel. Praise God. When your toys become more than your tools, you start to look like Rome. Praise God. Now, that's why one time I was asking a group of pastors and I told them, church was built on the prefix of the Roman, of Rome, Roman Catholic church was built on the prefix of the system and structure of Rome, which like I told you was Greek philosophy, Greek mythology, Egyptian mythology, and Persian Zoroaster. Islam was built that way. Protestantism was built that way. Right? Now, when the Pentecostals come through, yes, I know we're born again and we don't have a central place, but what systems do we use to build church? You're going to realize that almost 80% of the local churches in the Pentecostal born again movement still have many tenants of Rome. When I saw that many years ago, I decided not to build at Rome. It's one of the reasons why our ministry is growing so fast. I've understood the foundation that builds the church. More than 10,000 actually in four years. To the glory of God. Hallelujah. Because we are not building like Rome. More than 80% of the churches on the face of the earth are below 200 members. But I'll tell you why. What is killing them is what killed the Roman Empire. If the Roman Empire died and nobody speaks Latin, every man who builds under the structure and system of Rome will have frustration in the building of ministry. You will struggle. God will prove to you that you're the one building. He's not the one building. Because the mystery of building on the foundation of the gospel is that you don't build. God builds. He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Rome teaches you to build. The gospel teaches you to yield to Christ so he will build. When he builds your church, the gates of hell cannot prevail. Praise God. Somebody shout hallelujah. And that's how we build. We build by letting him build. They build by building with their own human understanding. But we build by letting him build. And letting him build means we allow his principles and patterns as arrayed in scripture to define and direct the way we build ministry. Gifts don't build ministry. And gifts don't run movements. It's more than that. Altars do. Praise God. That's why patterns are important, but only with a definitive altar. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. So now there is a demand for reforms. During that time, of course, universities have come up 
in that period, university started coming through and people were exposed to higher studies. Praise God. And the middle class rises in that period. And so people who have money as well start getting what? Getting uh, voices because when you have money, you have a voice. Praise God. During that time, the purpose is discredited. Praise God. People have lost faith in the papacy and the church because it looks like something. But also, there were crusaders who were being set by these churches and they went on around in places. And also, there was a sort of renaissance in the 1200s. They were being exposed to things outside what we were calling the Roman Empire. They were being introduced to Islam. They were being introduced to Greek thought, philosophers, Aristotle, Plato. They started to reason out certain things. And so the emperor, the Rome, Rome as an empire, also again started to become more and more what? No, 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 no more and more exposed to the evil it was and less and less popular. Praise God. Now, at that particular point, again, either we change the system or we fight. Revolution. We have to choose. Praise God. Now, what we call the Reformation period, hmm? what we call the Protestant Reformation, beginning between 1517 to 1658. It has three distinctive men that fan this flame, and they're important, each one. One of them, the first one, is John Wycliffe, who has heard of a guy called John Wycliffe. That fellow came out in the 1300s. Um, he was an Oxford professor, and while he was there, he was led to get into the Latin Vulgate, right? And then try to translate it to English. And then he went to the Greek original from where the Latin Vulgate is written. No, the, 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 the Greek, the original one, where the Latin Vulgate borrows. And then he translates also the Greek to English. And then he realizes that the Latin Vulgate deliberately was written with errors and edited deliberately with errors to build a system of Roman Catholic Church and not necessarily the revelation of Jesus Christ. For example, if you get the Roman Catholic Church right now, Roman Catholic Bible right now and look at the Ten Commandments and then look at your Bible and look at the Ten Commandments, you will see and they're different. Remember that part where it says you shall not create any molten images of your God and stuff? Go in the Roman Catholic Bible, cha Bible. it's not there. It's not there. And then they get one other uh, um, commandment and then split it in two, two to make the ten. There was many, many errors in there. Now, men start to discover that Mary is not the way. Jesus is the way. You understand? Repentance is made toward God and forgiveness of sins comes. No necessary ideas of penance acts and indulgences to win favor. Now there is a problem. Rome has a problem. A certain guy has gone back to the original Greek and translated it to English, which men can read. What do you think is the future of that fellow? Praise God. What do you think is the future of that fellow? Yes. Anybody who seeks to translate and give meaning, to open the eyes of men in history, is killed. You've read of William Tyndall. The moment he translated the Bible from Hebrew and Greek to English, he was killed immediately. Why? Because he was opening the eyes of men to truth. There's a price to preach speaking the truth. There's a price to speaking the truth. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. So he begins to write letters. And then he starts to build up a group of people. And when they start to read the truth, you know, rumblings come through. People start complaining. These guys lied to us. And then they had a group they used to call the mumblers. And so the church starts to look for a way 
to deal away with this fellow. Unfortunately, he died before they could kill him. And you know what they did? They dug up his body and burnt it to stake. So it was an example to all who seek to change the revelation of what? Of the Roman Catholic Church. They threw his body to the ashes. Then towards the late 1300s, this one was at the beginning, towards the late 1300s into the 1400s, another fellow called John Hus. One time he's moving and somebody gives him messages, letters that John Wycliffe had written. He said, what? He said, he's also a what? Yes, he was from Czechoslovakia. He was Bohemian. And when he reads this thing, he's like, this guy is deceived that long ago. The same thing on John Wycliffe starts to move in John Hus. And then his spirit tells him, no, I need to do whatever I can to see. That what? I bring the truth. And so he starts writing. Writing, 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 and debating. So one funny emperor called Sigismund, I call him Sigismund because the name is funny to even pronounce. He tricked this fellow and he told him, you know what? I think the things you're saying are very wonderful. We want to create a certain order and bring the bishops all through here to listen to you. Maybe you have something to teach us. John Hus thought this was a door open to him, but it was not. It was a trick. So he goes, he gives his defense and speaks to them how translations are wrong before the council because they promised him they would do him no harm. And then after he finishes speaking, the emperor tells him, no promise to a heretic is valid. We promised you on the precept that you would prove that you're not heretic. But if you're heretic, we don't promise heretics. What did they do? They threw the guy in prison for eight months. And after that, got him out of prison and burned him to stake. Why? He is going against the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. Remember, during that time, Rome, uh, Rome appoints emperor. And if Rome appoints emperor, it means that if you attack Rome, you are attacking emperor. Are you following what I'm saying? Students come through in Czechoslovakia, Bohemian students to fight. Why did they do it? They rioted it. What did the emperor do? He got hundreds of troops and armies and they killed those children. So that the voice was silenced that nobody should speak about salvation through faith. The problem was salvation through faith and faith alone in Christ. That statement looks simple, but it's very, very deep. Praise God. After the 1400s, from 1400s into the 1500s, the same thing on John Wycliffe looks for a monk called Martin Luther. He's seen the corruptions in church. He was a monk, he had dissuaded, separated himself from the Roman Catholic, but there were practices also in the monasteries that were Roman. But most importantly, he knows there's a problem, but, and his heart is crying, but he doesn't know where to find a relationship with. His father had ordained him to be a lawyer, he refused to be a lawyer and went to become a what? A monk and a Christian. He studied his books and he later goes to the church in Wittenberg. And then he says, you know what? I want to apply as professor to teach uh, Christianity. And then they allow him to teach. But while he started to begin to read, you know, there's a problem when a man reads the Bible himself. <laughs> the, the challenge with, with Roman Catholicism and all these religions, they have a set of people. Whether they're going to Islam, they have the, the sheikhs. And these sheikhs, are people who have studied Sharia. They are the ones who are qualified to teach. Laymen are not supposed to teach like it is in the Anglican Church, like it is in the Roman Catholic Church. But every time a man gets the Bible and reads it himself, there's a problem. And this is what was a problem too. Because he was obliged to teach at Wittenberg as a professor, he began to read. And then he lands on the works of Wycliffe and Hus. He's like, oh my God. Praise God. So he starts to what? To ask himself, God, how does a man attain salvation? How is a man born again? How does a man get to you? And then one time, he used to also do certain um, acts of penance. 
right? Mm. In fact, it's written in history that one time he sinned before his Lord and then he broke glasses. And then he started to crawl on them to punish himself. I mean, they do it all the time. Catholics used to cut them slaves. You remember Father Bill? They used to say he used to lash himself. That's that God forgives him his sins. And while he's in the middle of that thing, Romans 1, 16 and 17 drops in his spirit. And that killed everything that he knew. He says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of God, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. He says, it is written, the just shall live by faith and his own glasses. He gets up and says, hey, this is not what makes me righteous. It is faith. It is faith. The light goes on. <laughs> Martin Luther, if you read history, he had not, his intention was not a movement. No. In fact, when he writes the 95 page thesis on justification through faith and puts it on the Wittenberg Church, his intention was to invite debate. It wasn't intended to break a movement or he, that's not what was his spirit. But through the form, he brings a debate. There was a fellow called John Eck. Him and, my, and, and Martin Luther debate for eight, 18 days, debating justification by faith. And towards the 18th day, Martin starts to disprove John Eck. And you know what John Eck brings? The usual religious spirit stand. He says, how can you go against the Pope? <laughs> He tells him, you're starting to sound like who's? And then Martin asks him, who is the Pope? <laughs> is he the creator of heaven and earth? Is he the sole foundation of my faith or the scriptures that we are reading? Luther is in trouble. <laughs> in fact, he wrote a pamphlet called The Captivity of Babylon. You go read it. Look for it. Martin Luther, Captivity of Babylon by Martin Luther. It's interesting. He starts to highlight how Roman Catholicism, religion, had put people in what? In bondage. What do you think happens to such men? He's supposed to die. But he's also ruthless. They told, he told them, if you burn my books, I burn yours. Praise God. He started burning things. He didn't care. In fact, to save his life, a friend of his had to take him away for one or two years and then put him in hiding because they feared the man was going to be killed. Then, usual, they tell him, repent. <laughs> they told him, repent. Recant this thing you're talking about, or else we shall excommunicate you. Use your threat. If you don't do this, we'll chase you away. If you don't do this, you'll have... Let me tell you, no notable move has happened within the spirit and church of religion. It has never happened. Every move you see in church history, they always come out of religion. I met a guy one time who, I, I think he's so deceived, but I know he'll get it one day. He told me the Lord has kept him in the Anglican church to revive it. It has never happened. <laughs> Even John Wesley, who died Anglican, later his movement turned to Methodist. It does not happen. You can't revive a religious system. You can't. Because religion is not ignorant men only, but it is deliberately ignorant men. <laughs> deliberately ignorant men. Why? Because they refuse to see the truth. The truth is always available. Men come and provoke them to truth, and then they what? True to form, he dispelled, Martin Luther dispelled the ideas of bishops and those submissions that were abusive and manipulative. Then during that time, of course, the Roman Catholic Church, the priests, those so-called bishops were not allowed to marry. He advised many of them to get married, and he started marrying off some. And he was among the first people who did service in another tongue and language. Remember, Roman Catholicism also has an order in which language, like Islam, right? Islam is Arabic. In England, it's English. You understand what I'm saying? And then also in the history of, 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 of church, we start to see men singing. Back in the day, 
it wasn't like the way you sing. No, it was guys just humming lines of and everyone was just supposed to be there watching. But now Luther tells you, join me, join me. Come on, let us all sing together for God. So that was very, very, very revolutionary. Praise God. Very, 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 very revolutionary. Praise God. And that which is begun by John Wycliffe, that which is begun by John Hus, that which is begun by Martin Luther, is what goes to Switzerland in Zurich, in Zurich sorry, and begets what you call the Baptists. Goes to Geneva, begets what we call the Reformed faith under Jacobus Arminius and John Calvin. Goes to Scotland and becomes what they call the Presbyterians under John Knox, and it goes to England, and it's what becomes the Puritans. This move is big. And later when I get into present history and I go through America, you will see that America is divided between two. The Baptists and the Methodists, the Presbyterians and the Congregationalists. Calvin, Jacob Arminius, they are all ministers of grace, but there is a debate on tulip. Limited atonement, unlimited atonement. Who is who? Where is it? And that draws up to today, present truth, 2019. When we get into now, when you understand the grace doctrine, you realize now that debates have ensued between John and Calvin. <laughs> Hallelujah. How does the gospel cross to England? Right? Because that is very key. How does the gospel cross England to become what you call the Anglican church? It's important for you to understand how the other block is, is drawn. Praise God. Now, there's a fellow called Henry VIII. It's between 1400 to 1500. This fellow was also, like I said, during that time, many nations, whether Spain or Italy or where, they were all submitted to the church, Roman Catholic Church, and consequently, because of spiritual submission, the emperor was defined under that. You see that? So England also was submitted to, to the Pope. And this fellow Henry VIII was called the defender of the faith also. He hates anything that is Martin Luther. He hates anything that is Calvin or later. I don't know, but that's, he hates anything that is John Wycliffe. He hates anything that is Hus. He's 100% sold in. The doctrines have come during that time. Praise God. Now, he marries a woman called Catherine of Spain. Catherine of Spain was a former wife to his brother who had died called Philip. So he had taken over his late brother's wife, which is no sin because she was dead to the covenant. And so they have four children. Three of them die. And uh, Henry gets the idea. Somebody gives him the idea that this is a curse. You shouldn't have married this woman, right? And also, sadly, in the children that had died and the one that existed, they had failed to have a male child. And remember, this is a monarchy. England, they believe in sonship, patriarchal, like Rome. The son must take over, not the woman. So he needs an heir. So he goes to the Pope, spiritual father and authority, and tells the Pope, Papa, this is a curse on me and the kingdom is at risk. Please allow me to get married to another woman. The Pope says, no. No. Henry is wrought. He says, look, I am submitting to you. I've defended the faith. I've fought for you. I'm fighting your battles. And I'm here telling you the kingdom has a problem and you won't allow me to marry another woman. He says, no. So what does Henry VIII do? He goes against the what? the Pope, and then gets himself a woman called Anne Bolena. Praise God. So, and Anne also does not have male children. Anne also gives birth to what? Praise the Lord. And so he does what? He kills her. Yeah, because she's also a curse. Then he looks for another lady. He marries another lady called Jane Seymour. And indeed, she gets him another young boy called Edward, who, after the death of this fellow, takes over the what? 
the crown, and then he's called Edward the Fourth. Now, this boy was sickly, and he took over when he was still a bit younger. But the Protestants, the Puritans, got to him quicker than Roman Catholic could, and so he embraces the Calvinistic doctrine, the Martin Luther doctrine, the Grace doctrine. And then he embraces the Protestant. Now, as he's ruling as king, unfortunately, the fellow dies before his time. And who was next in line to take over? The daughter of the first wife, Catherine of Spain. Praise God. The lady was called Queen Mary. In fact, in history, she's called Bloody Mary because for her she was Catholic. So she starts to kill anything and attack anything that is Protestant. Now, you must understand where the idea Protestant comes from. To protest, right? To protest. To protest. And what were they protesting against? They were protesting against the Roman Catholic Church and the system thereof. Are you following what I'm saying? So that is where the Protestant moves through. But they embrace the doctrine of John Wycliffe, John Hus, Martin Luther, which later is Calvin, Jacob Arminius, Present Truth, uh, Grace Message, and Roma, Kruvega Grace, and the rest of us. <laughs> Praise God. It's the same message. Praise God. And she put Protestants to death. Now, as she did that, also her, before her end of time, she what? She dies. You see? And when she dies, now the daughter of Anne Boleyn comes in power. She was called Elizabeth I. You get it? So almost all the three children of this fellow, all of them somehow rule the crown at a particular point. Now, Anne Boleyn has the problem of the sister who is Catholic and the brother who is Protestant. Now, she creates what you here call hybrid. <laughs> 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 Praise God. She creates what you guys call what? She builds a Roman Catholic system and structure, but with a Protestant and grace message service. You get it? So the service, the message is Protestant, but the system and structure is Roman Catholic because she's convinced that there is something about Rome that knows how to rule. And there is something about Protestantism and the grace message that knows how to preserve the church. So she wants to mix both of them. England is Roman Catholic structure and system, but their message and theology was inclining more to the Protestantisms of Martin Luther, John Hus, and Wycliffe. Praise God. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. And so the group, there was a group that had run away when Mary was killing people. That group went in Geneva. Remember where Geneva was? Who was in Geneva? Who was in Geneva? Calvin, right? And so they see another way of doing things, another way of doing ministry. When Bloody Mary dies and Elizabeth is queen, these guys come back. And when they come back, they realize that they cannot connect anymore with the system that was hybrid. And then they become Puritans. From the word purity, we believe in the purity of the soul, the spirit, the message, the system, the structure, and everything. That's how we have the place of what you and I call what? The Puritans. Praise God. Unfortunately, Elizabeth did not have children. <laughs> it's so funny, but Elizabeth did not what? Have children. So on the onset towards her death and everything, she feels that the fellow uh, from Scotland, James IV, has to come through and then took over the crown, who then in history was also a disgrace to the Puritans and the believers then because they discovered, number one, the fellow was homosexual. It's so sad. Praise God. And then when he comes in power also, he appoints a Roman Catholic bishop in Canterbury. Now again, Roman Catholicism comes through. See, now, you must understand these things because when you get to history, which cannot be altered and changed, you ask yourself, 
How in the world are people still subject to certain systems? Look at the system that built the Anglican Church. A man killed his wives. I don't care the doctrine, but look at the foundation. Know your roots. Look at the system that built the Roman Catholic Church. How many lives have been killed? How many deaths have taken place in the building of that structure? Any structure and system that kills men that way, I don't think it is valid enough to qualify for a foundation. So these Puritans feel like they can't live in in England, and that's when they cross seas. Remember Elizabeth the First, she was also called the Queen, the Virgin Queen, right? She she had started the idea of colonization. She's the one who crosses into America and then takes over the lands in America, the one present day Virginia. That's her. You understand what I'm saying? So they had information that there was a place across the seas that was more beautiful than this was, and though they move now as a hundred people, right? And when they move as a hundred people, they all go and settle into what? America. And then they say, let us copulate, produce, and multiply, and the numbers start growing, and then they agree that in every community of 50 people, we shall put a school to educate our children, and that's where the concept and idea of Harvard was begotten. Harvard was built by the Puritans. And you'll see that many of these uh, universities, whether Yale or all these big ones, Preston, uh, you will see all of those are attached to the movements of the Spirit. Praise God. Now, the story in England is not ended. Kings change, come and go, come and go, and then years later, there's a very interesting fellow I also need to tell you about. He was called King Charles I. Now, this fellow, why you should know about him is later on, under here, there are Puritans who stayed, hmm? and they also started multiplying under there. So this fellow was very dubious. He was a main king, and then one time I think he dismisses the whole parliament, and then the Puritans don't agree with him. During that time again, Roman Catholicism had more imprints in England than the Protestant movement, and the Puritans have a problem with the way the governments were run because the systems and structures of Rome Wherever they are put, they always frustrate. They always frustrate. And unfortunately, many governments are like that in the world. Many governments are built on Roman law. Praise God. And then after that, of course, these Puritans clash, and then they refuse, and then there's a fellow called Oliver Cromwell. And 20,000 Puritans get behind him, and they say, you know what, let's post this king. And they fight the fellow, and indeed they defeat him. And then the Puritans get into power. But sadly, history tells you they failed to run government. I don't know why Christians are good at coming together for war, but they are so poor at building together. Division has been in the body of Christ for as long as we can remember. The Puritan government failed because it was disunited, disunity. We have many people here who don't even agree in doctrine. Praise God. So later on, of course, William III and Mary from Scotland are crowned. The monarch is rebuilt because the Puritans failed to what? Yes. But the wars have ensued. That does not change the fact that the Protestant and Catholic wars are there. In fact, it is written in history that 35 percent between the times of the 30 years of 1618 to 1648, 35 percent of Europeans were killed of wars between the Protestant movement and the Roman Catholic. 35 percent of people were killed until towards about 1648 where this guy says, no, enough is enough. We cannot have this nonsense. We cannot, it doesn't matter what it is. We cannot always continue killing each other in the name of what we call faith. And so they come together and gun in what they call the Peace of Westphalia in, 19, in 1648. And they say, you know what? They met in Holland and they say, you know what? Regardless of what it is, we must at least have peace. We can't continue losing people in the name of religion. And during that time, of course, many nations were sovereign, so it was agreed. You know what? German, France, so and so, Italy, stay Roman Catholic, and then those that have taken and decided to take on the Protestant, let them take on the Protestant. Protestants don't attack the Romans for land or anything. Romans don't attack the Protestant. Everyone should respect everyone's faith and tolerance should be accepted. And that is when that treaty came and somehow bloodshed was what? Was reduced.
But the Catholics never stopped preaching. When they stopped fighting, they continued preaching. Praise God. And Ignatius of Loyola, they tell you from the 14th into the 15th century, that fellow got a thousand very honorable men, took them to the Pope, submitted to them, and those are what you call the Jesuits. And then they started evangelizing the Roman Catholic doctrine. There's another fellow called Francis of Xavier. He went to India, Malay, Japan, China, and started Catholicism there. That guy moved more than many evangelists can. There's another guy called Bartholome de la Casas. He went to Mexico and baptized more than a million Roman Catholics. What happened? As these ones were debating doctrines, the Romans went and started evangelizing in lands that men never knew before. Even on our coast, Roman Catholicism came before the Anglican came. The White Fathers, Father Laudel and Brother Amen. Do you remember those people? Mapera, Montpierre. Yeah? Those guys were here way before the Protestants were here through Livingstone and the rest. And so when the peace was there for them, from the background, they kept on pushing the Roman Catholic movement through teaching and outreaches, through um, winning souls. Praise God. And so there was peace. Somebody shout, hallelujah. hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word. We know that all of us are here, but you have told us not to remove the ancient landmarks that were set by our fathers. There are things we are learning, and they will help us define the next step, the next page, the next concept and understanding of the Christian church. Please help our hearts not to judge. Help our minds to understand and receive what must be received that will write our own story that our children will look at us and say these ones knew better. In Jesus name. Amen.